Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, James W. Gesso, as always. And if you're watching this on YouTube, which, if you didn't know, is, is totally an option. You could be watching this on YouTube. Anyways, I'm in a car. Now, I had every intention, if you can see to my uh, side here, to be out in a beautiful park. Because every opportunity I get to make the working hard process, which I do every day with this podcast and with the various other things I do around my website, jameswgesso.com, every opportunity I get to take that working hard outside, I do, because I don't mind being inside and in my studio space, but... um, well, to be honest, I, I really prefer <laughs> I really prefer to be outside if I can if I can make it happen. However, it was so windy, it was it was unrelentingly windy, and so we are currently recording this intro from inside a car. So today's episode is with Christopher Timmerman. He is researching DMT. I'm not going to give his bio here because you're just going to hear it in a moment, but what I am going to mention is that this intro is going to be reasonably short because, well, I've got some very exciting news that is about to launch likely in the next episode, and so I'm going to reserve that a little bit uh, here and just jump right into the episode after one point, which is that this podcast and basically everything that I do is funded by listeners like yourself. That is primarily through Patreon, but it is also through donations uh, over PayPal and also over Bitcoin. Patreon is a platform by which listeners like yourself can become patrons here of the show and of my various other things, my YouTube channel and the written work on my website. Being a patron means, in the old sense, I pay you to create, ultimately. And so if you become a patron, which is to say you pledge 2 or $4 through Patreon or more, if that's what you're interested in doing, then what you're ultimately doing is saying, you know what, I really like what you're doing, I'm appreciating your content, I'm appreciating where you're going with this, and I'd like to give you a little something as a show of my support for you to continue to keep doing it. So. Your support as a patron is really, really valuable to me in not only continuing with this podcast, but also continuing onwards with my career as a writer and a public educator, and hopefully, uh, you know, an enthusiast supporting not only the positive growth of psychedelic culture worldwide, but the positive and beneficial growth of each of the independent people who collectively make up the psychedelic renaissance and the psychedelic culture. And that being said, there are a few people who are in the higher tier brackets uh, for pledges on Patreon, and that is Dean, Melanie, Thomas, Greg. Thank you all so much for continuing to contribute so um, so fully. Uh, of course, I have deep appreciation for all the patrons, no matter what amount uh, that is being offered, because every little bit counts towards um, counts towards this thing that I do and being able to earn a full-time living doing it. That's it. Enjoy this episode with Christopher Timmerman and I will see you on the outro. Christopher Timmerman obtained a bachelor's in science in psychology in Santiago, Chile and a master's in science in cognitive neuroscience at the University of Bologna in Italy. He is currently completing a PhD in Imperial College London, leading a project focusing on the effects of DMT in the brain and human consciousness. He is interested in the use of methods bridging the relationship between the phenomenology evoked by the psychedelic experience and changes in brain activity using diverse neuroimaging tools. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, James, yeah, happy to you know talk a bit about the the research and other interests as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I feel like I feel like the listeners aren't completely naive, um, but assuming that some listeners might be, why don't you tell us what is DMT and why is it interesting for you to research? Okay, uh, DMT is a molecule. Uh, and it's found in various, you know, uh, diverse organisms, 
uh, in nature, uh, several plants and several mammals as well. There's some evidence for that. But uh, more importantly, for you know uh, the things that I'm interested in, the work that we're doing here in, are at Imperial College London, it's uh, psychedelic drugs, a very potent psychedelic drug. Uh, it is when it's used, it is usually smoked which gives a very potent but short-acting uh, experience. Uh, and the experience itself is very rich in terms of its contents, in terms of its meaning. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, it's a drug that it's found in the brew, in the Amazonian brew, ayahuasca. This is one of the main constituents of the, of, you know, that, brew itself or the tea itself, um, which is also very interesting because uh, it, there's uh, a lot of user reports in terms of health benefits by using ayahuasca. It has a long tradition within the Amazon itself. Uh, but the, more specifically, going back to your question, why is it interesting for my research? Uh, it's because of the experience it provides. It's a unique opportunity to have uh, these experiences in a lab setting in which we can give DMT and we can generate these uh, baffling experiences in controlled environments. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a particular opportunity for us to understand some of the mechanisms of consciousness because we're able to induce uh, this very strong consciousness altering experiences in a way that we can control it and we can do it safely within the lab. So by looking at the brain and looking at an experience um, and by using DMT as a mediator between those, we can learn a lot, uh, you know, about both the brain and the mind. Hmm. So I know that um, perhaps I'm just thinking about a way to preface this question. Can you uh, maybe just give a short description of what reports have been from people who have um it, people in the research like what the general scheme is you're talking about this 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 bizarre uh experience that emerges for people who have taken dmt but again for someone who wouldn't understand how entirely bizarre that is can you list off just a couple of the qualities that um seem to be uh seem to prevail in in users reports of their dmt experiences sure yeah so uh like the main features in terms of, of how it, you know, how it unfolds, the experience is usually said that it's being like uh, thrown out of the canyon at the beginning. So people have this very strong rush or, uh, and this, you know, uh, when people have strong doses of the experience itself, um, after this rush comes this kind of like entering into the space with geometrical features, etc. And then an actual breaking through into what many people call a DMT space. And this space feels like a different reality, a different dimension. Um, a place that at the same time feels uh, even more real than common day reality. So um, not only that, uh, one of the other main features is this uh, phenomenon of the sense presence. Uh, so people feel that sometimes they are communicating with other entities uh, present with them in this space. Um, and I don't know, general reports speak about these presences sort of like welcoming people, for example, or guiding them or providing them some information of sorts. So I'd say, yeah, those are the kind of like the main interesting and what you would say probably baffling aspects of the DMT experience, which makes it quite fascinating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely uh, being able to map and pay attention to where the baseline, uh, where the baseline is, and then continue to map it when we go somewhere totally different, and then come back and sort of look at the results, the data from uh, from both ends of things, and how we got to each can definitely unfold. Um, a lot of understanding about about the nature of our experience. You talk about your research as um, exploring the the mechanisms underlying consciousness. How do you observe those mechanisms? How do you how do you rate them? Like, what are you looking for 
and um, what do we understand about why we're looking for those things to understand awareness and consciousness? Well, the main idea is that um, on a very, very broad level, I mean, the way that we're looking at this is from many different angles, but from a very broad level, is you have your normal waking state of consciousness, your normal waking state, what you would call ordinary reality sort of mode, if you will, right? And this is different from when you're asleep, uh, right? So you've got these two different sort of states, right? Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, with DMT, uh, we're able to, up, you know, like change or introduce a new element into experience, which is a different state of consciousness that doesn't have to do with sleep or with coma or what you usually refer to as reduced states of consciousness. So what happens is this alteration of the quality of consciousness itself. And this is quite a, you know, kind of like a muddy field within the neurosciences. You know, how do we understand, how do we quantify uh, these processes in the brain? You know, the, the, the phenomenon of qualia, you know, um, how do things or how do experience feel like? We don't really have a way of actually measuring those things. It's very difficult for us. It's very difficult to quantify those kind of like uh, terrains. So what's interesting with psychedelic drugs, we have a definite change of how experience feels. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, in parallel, we can understand what's going on in the brain. So if we develop, or if we have the right tools to understand what's happening on one side of things through experience and on the other side of things in the brain, we can then build these bridges and we can understand, you know, many of these complicated mechanisms related to the experience, but at the neural level, so understand where are the brain mechanisms per se. I don't know if that's clear enough, but mm -hmm. that's kind of like the general, general idea. And I can go into details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more, um, a little bit more details. Uh, so when you're when you're observing the brain, you're observing them through um, fMRIs, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Is that correct? Yeah. So we've done a, a first bit of the study, and uh, it was a pilot phase, and you know we gave different doses of DMT, and for that we used EEG. Okay. Uh, so electroencephalography which captures uh, brain rhythms. So it's all about figuring out, um, you know, when things are occurring in the brain. So you have a nice, what you call a nice temporal resolution, but they give a nice image of uh, these patterns of activity, you know, these synchronized patterns of activity that happen in the brain spontaneously. So if you've ever heard about alpha waves, beta waves, gamma, and stuff like that, this is all about something that you can measure with the EEG. And we've done this, uh, that with that measure, we've done the first bit of the study. And we're now moving on into the second bit of the study, which is going to be using uh, fMRI uh, and EEG at the same time. So we're going to be able to map out these rhythms, but at the same time know uh, with quite an accurate location of where things are happening in the brain. So you have a nice spatial resolution. You have these opportunities to combine both of these techniques. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and the... Now, just correct me if I'm wrong here, but the kind of things that you're looking for are um, what's called the neurocorrelates of consciousness. Is that right? Uh, that, that would be kind of like, yeah, what people usually do when uh, they try to understand, you know, they compare a state in which there is no consciousness, for example, in the dreamless sleep, uh, versus a state in which there is consciousness, you know, and the, uh, like when you're normally wake, you're normally awake. Uh, and this, this will be a way of probing into the neural correlates of consciousness. In our case, it's more about the neural consciousness the neural correlates of psychedelic consciousness, maybe you could you could kind of say mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of like the way that we're approaching at the moment. Yeah, great. So, what do we already know? So this this could include and, and of course like differentiate between which is which. But what do we know about DMT from uh, and what's happening in the brain? How it's affecting uh, how it's affecting brain operation from prior to your research, during your research, and 
Also, what you think from that, you're going to discover in your upcoming research. Right. Um, so what do we generally know about, you know, what DMT does to the brain? We know from, you know, um, studies that have used ayahuasca. Uh, there are some old studies, are very, very old, like in the 50s. Um, Stephen Sara, which was the guy that actually uh, discovered the effects of DMT, he did an EEG study. Uh, um, but also, you know, we have the ayahuasca studies. Well, ayahuasca is not the same necessarily as DMT because ayahuasca is a combination of drugs, right? Uh, but uh, what we know of uh, ayahuasca is that um, the main effect that it does in a similar manner as LSD and psilocybin does, uh, magic mushrooms, um, is that they inhibit this kind of like a predominant brain rhythm, which is called the alpha, the alpha rhythm, right? So the alpha rhythm is this... Um, brain wave frequency, you know, which relates to our normal waking state with eyes closed, you know, this thing goes up. Um, it is believed it's not as clear, it's not clear cut, but we think that this brain rhythm is related to some sort of filter, right? A way of filtering out, uh, you know, the information that we're processing. Right, so what happens uh, with ayahuasca, what we know about the research itself, uh, in a similar way as with LSD and mushrooms, is that this, this filter is kind of like taken off a bit. Um, so more information is being processed in the brain, which kind of like neatly maps out to the experience of, you know, having visual imagery, of having, you know, kind of like this loose way of thinking about things, etc. So in a broad manner, that is kind of like what we know uh, uh, in terms of EEG, so figuring out brain rhythms. In terms of figuring out um, uh, fMRI measures, so what things are happening in, you know, in a precise kind of like spatial manner, uh, there's a study showing that the default mode network, uh, there's a deactivation of the default mode network. And the follow mode network is something that um, some researchers have linked up with the idea of kind of like the self, if you will. Uh, but it's, it's not quite precisely that, but it's that may be part, some parts of the process that they're encoded by the follow mode network. So, so that to, drops to be, off as To well. be clear, just checking in, sorry, yeah. um, by the self, you mean sort of um, the operational sense of self, the I, the ego, like what we normally think about, how we normally right. perceive things. Yeah. So the default mode network is something that is highly, highly active when, when people are just, you know, laying down, thinking about themselves, thinking about the past. When It's what activates when you're in a in sort of like idle state, mm -hmm. not doing any sort of partic particular task. You could think about it as like a, as this anti-task sort of state. You're not engaged in the external world, but you're engaged in, you know, your thoughts, your processes, etc. So it's kind of like this general thing in which, you know, thinking about oneself is also included. Um, so we know this also deactivates, right? Uh, this is uh, what we know generally about ayahuasca uh, and a bit about DMT. What we're seeing in, our, in, in, in the study that we've just done, that we just completed, is that we also see this very, very strong reduction of, of this main kind of like frequency band, the alpha frequency band. So this filter mechanism is also taken off, if you will. Or what we see in terms of brain activity, this kind of like filter is taken off. And what we see is that it's uh, at the same time is being replaced uh, by more what you would say unpredictable uh, brain signal. So the brain signal become, uh, becomes, if you will, more entropic, more disorganized, or if you will, more brain states are available. Or another way of looking at it would be, say, if you have a dictionary uh, and each word is a possible brain state, in the DMT state, you have a larger dictionary. So you have more of a vocabulary of possibility of brain states happening in the same time. So it's a very kind of like it's a it's a step forward in terms of the EEG. It's a little step forward that we're making, but we're kind of like clarifying some of these mechanisms.
Mm -hmm. I want to I want to jump out a little bit into left left field here, and I I don't know if if some of what I'm going to say comes off as like a citizen science or what. But as you're talking about getting the brainwave state that that is present during a DMT experience, if I'm also thinking about um, brainwave entrainment, like the kind of thing you like meditation tapes that use binaural beats or isochronic tones or or what have you, or, or the theories behind um, light and sound frequencies to change a state of awareness. And recently uh, listening to an interview with Dennis McKenna, I heard him talking about a guy who had invented a light that produces DMT-like effects. I understand that this might be asking a lot of you, but do you think it would be possible or reasonable to assume that it, we could create exogenous frequency um, ex- exogen- ex- oh Jesus, exogenous frequencies that could modulate brain activity into a state similar to that of DMT without the actual consumption of the substance. Once we understand what that brain, those brain frequencies are. I think that in principle that, I mean, the concept of entrainment does, you know, I think it has been tested on some level. I, I'm not that, you know, like familiar with the literature, but what, from what I know is that, yeah, I think it kind of works. So in principle, you know, you could say, yeah, maybe. Uh, but the thing is that so far the, the light, you know, the light experience and stuff like that in terms of user reports, uh, it's not, it's not that, it's not that similar to the DMT state from what, you know, from what users say. Uh, it appears that, you know, like I say, in principle, yes, but so far that intensity of the experience that is caused by DMT uh, appears to be uh, out of reach at the moment, you know, with the current, you know, the neural entrainment uh, mechanisms available. Um, yeah, but it, but it is hard to say. I mean, and there appears to be a lot of like uh, individual variability in that, you know, like some people say this is very much, you know, a DMT state. Others say this is not at all a DMT state. So it seems to be very, very, very variable. Um, we're still figuring out like um, where are the exact neural mechanisms of these drugs, also a DMT. So it's hard to say as well from a mechanistic perspective. Yes, it, you know it will generate the same neural changes. You know right, that we're yeah. after. We're still trying to understand those specific mechanisms to kind of like give a like a concrete you know final answer on that. But I think it's an intriguing possibility for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find it. I find it interesting. I think about um, Iliade's idea of like the techniques of ecstasy and uh, in our in our present. In our present, uh, I guess, where we are as a, as, a, as a human species and we're developing these technologies. I know techniques and technologies are obviously root in the same, but like physical, di- like machine technologies that can catalyze states of ecstasy in some way or another. But I don't want to dwell on this um, too much. It was just kind of a fun idea that I thought up in that moment. I want to ask you because you mentioned uh, in the beginning your research about coming to better understand the mechanisms um, of consciousness. And also you referenced uh, ayahuasca as a part of sort of the current foundations for DMT research and a place where DMT is used regularly and referenced over to their its um, reported medical um, or healing potential. I'm curious if you believe that um, that there might be some sort of inherently positive effect happening to the brain um, when we when we kind of bring on board exogenous DMT, like maybe something akin to uh, like melatonin having an antioxidant effect. Mm. I think it's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely an interesting theory. And, and I know, uh, this, uh, Ede Freska, which is a Hungarian researcher, and he's looking into you know, some of the potential, you know, actual medical benefits in terms of like actual brain cells, you know, like preventing hypoxia, lack of oxygen. So, uh, the possibility of using exogenous DMT in people that are, you know, in critical states, I think it's definitely an interesting idea. Um, I think we, we still need research to determine something like that. So it has an inherent positive effect. So what you might say is an inherent positive, positive effect to the brain, 
uh, I would say that is n- we still need to find out more stuff to say that yes, you know, that could be definitely something that uh, you know the DMT does, but it has a, like a positive function, if you will. In terms of like the mind and the therapeutic benefit, that's you know kind of like a different story. Um, there's there are some there is evidence showing up that ayahuasca can be quite beneficial um, in terms of mental health, for example. You know, uh, not only that, there's like this huge kind of like history of ayahuasca use um, for medical purposes uh, in pre-Columbian societies. Uh, and that's interesting. Uh, that's something that needs to be put to the test. You know, there's even some research, uh, like case studies, saying that ayahuasca might be helpful for you know cancer and stuff like that. This is also something to be researched, and this may talk about an inherent positive effect. Uh, but based on the research, it's it's really hard for me to kind of like uh, tell you. Yeah, I think it does. You know, some, something inherently positive to the brain. Um, in terms of mental health, I think there's definitely a potential and that, that should be, you know, rigorously, you know, researched. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah, definitely with ayahuasca, there's a, there's a consideration towards how much of the medicinal effect is coming f- directly from the DMT and how much of it is coming from, um, the other components, the, har- the harmalines or the, what's the word I'm looking for? Beta something. Carbolines, beta carbolines, yeah, yeah the beta. that are present in the yeah. in the vine and stuff, and, and even the combination between them. I'm curious, Absolutely. what um, do you think? Actually, maybe this question is more. I'm going to switch on to another one. As someone in the field around um, DMT research, there's been some, uh, I guess, some reports recently that I believe Rick Strassman and some other people had developed a machine that would time. Uh, that would properly time DMT doses into the bloodstream to create uh, basically keeping people in the DMT peak for an extended period of time. Do you know much about that? And can you maybe talk about it to, um, to the audience at all? Sure. Yeah. So this was, um, that's quite interesting because yeah, it was a paper that uh, Andrew Gallimore wrote with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Rick Strassman and, and they both kind of like, when we were setting up the study, we had the idea of actually having a continuous DMT infusion, uh, which is basically what this is about, right? So the machine is speaks about a, a way of, you know, you're keeping the people in that state by kind of like drip, drip feeding the, the infusion. So you get them continuously in that state. It's just a, a way of giving the drug in which you're not pushing the whole right, drug right away, but you're giving it in a way that it's, you know, controlled for you to be on that state uh, throughout 30 minutes or what have. So we were interested because it's so short and we wanted to do it, you know, in Travinas, uh, at the beginning of the research, we wanted to, you know, uh, we wanted to do this kind of like this kind of thing, you know, keep keeping people in, in a prolonged state uh, in that space. Uh, and we found out that there's a group in Germany that actually did this, uh, researchers in Germany, and they kept people in DMT state for like 30 minutes or more. Uh, this is a research team led by, uh, you know, Kuzulus Mayfrank, which is a psychosis researcher in Germany. And they did this kind of like 10 years ago. Um, so using that model, we kind of like, we wanted to go forward with it, but we were a bit unsure. And so, you know, in this conversation, we were speaking with uh, Rick, which was giving us some, you know, um, he was giving us, providing some help in terms of how to handle the drug and what have you, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Also, Andrew Gallimore joined the conversation and he kind of like went in and, and he had his model and he developed this model and he finally, you know, published this paper, which you're talking about right now. Um, I think it's quite an interesting idea, but the reason why we decided not to use that uh, was because uh, that is a whole study in itself that needs to be done, you know, first separate from an MRI machine because you want to test the safety of it, right? So if you're keeping people in the DMT state for 30 minutes um, in a, you know, in a concentration that is high enough to be in that what many users report as the breakthrough space, you want to make sure that it's safe first, right? And that would be a whole different study in itself. So we decided not to go in it. That being said, 
uh, that being said, I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting possibility, but it should be tested, you know, uh, you know, the, the machine, if you want, uh, if you want to call it like that. So one thing that may happen with it is that you're giving too much DMT, right? So people are having very intense experiences that may generate, you know, strong anxiety, uh, you know, just unpleasant feelings, adverse effects, how you would call them in research. Uh, the other option is that, you know, you're getting too little, you know, people are um, not getting into that space that you want, you want to get to, uh, they want to be in. Yeah, is mm -hmm, that clear? Mm -hmm. you, uh, maybe it was a bit too long. No, that's okay, know. that's okay. So, <laughs> yeah, okay, cool, I'm, cool. I'm really just like, because we talked about <laughs> basically everything that I, wa I wanted to talk about. All of those questions were pretty much answered in the conversation of the first, like, 15, 15 or so minutes. So now it's just like thinking like, okay, I've got this expert <laughs> sitting in front of me who's studying DMT. Like, what could I ask him of like all the DMT questions that I have that somebody, that somebody could answer. This is the guy. So I have another question and it's about endogenous okay. DMT. And I'm curious if you can talk about what we know about if, if you know about our bodies containing DMT and what you might, um, what you feel and what the sort of larger community feels might be the role of DMT in the body. Right. Yeah. So this is an interesting one because like endogenous DMT is something that is talked about quite a lot, but we don't have that much evidence about, I mean, there is evidence that it is produced in the body. Um, there is some evidence, you know, we need further studies of course, but there is some evidence that there is and, the evidence, the evidence that we have is that it's mainly in the lungs, I think, uh, I'm not quite sure on this, but, you know, it's deposited in the lungs. And there seems to be mechanisms in place, you know, to carry this DMT, you know, the DMT molecule easily into the brain. So, kind of like, and there are also some, you know, key precursors in the brain for DMT also to be formed in the brain. So, it is plausible, you know, that, you know, there is DMT related activity in the brain that is produced endogenously. Uh, and there are some, you know, some studies with mammals, uh, which have only sh have also shown that there is actual DMT in the brain of mammals. Now that leap into, you know, humans is, you know, something that needs to be tested. Uh, some of those studies also need to be replicated. So like my kind of like super conservative scientists would say like, Oh, we need further evidence, kind of like to establish that this endogenous DMT has an important role to play in the brain. And then the second question would be, you know, that it plays a role in experience. And what is that role in experience? And just and generally, you know, based on Rick Strassman's, uh, you know, theories, uh, this uh, endogenous DMT would be related to uh, spiritual experiences in general, uh, near death experiences, extraordinary experiences, etc. And I think it's, you know, it's it's definitely an interesting theory, and you could kind of like think why um, people have come up with such theories. You know, based on the experience of the DMT experience itself. You know, uh, many of the future of the features of the DMT experience are very similar to the near death experience, and this is something that we're kind of like picking up as well in our research. You know, nobody's coming out saying. Oh, we had a near death experience, but many of those features are present in the experience, the common features. So it's, it's an interesting link, whether it is the same one, whether, you know, endogenous DMT is actually playing a role in these experiences or even in spontaneous kind of like hallucinations, if you will, is something that is, is not easily established and right now it's still very much in the realm of theory. Uh, and I think that like th there's this thing, you know, the, the general public, you know, has really, you know, uh, went deep with this story because it's a really intriguing one. You know, we have sort of like a mechanistic exp explanation of why these extraordinary experiences occur. But, um, we're still not, you know, not there in there in that specific domain to say, yes, that is the experience itself and it's linked with endogenous DMT. 
So it's it's I'd say like the function of indigenous DMT, we don't know. We really don't know. You know, some some researchers think and they have a bit of evidence backing that up, saying that it's well it's linked to, you know, biological mechanisms and the survival of the organism, of the cells, you know, and other researchers say, well, it's it's fundamental. It was fundamental for the you know evolution of, of the species. And at some point, you know, we had higher levels of DMT, and that allowed us to develop some certain you know kind of like cognitive functions that we now use daily. Uh, but now it only pops up in dreams, etc. And other researchers say, well, it plays a role in death. It plays a role in you know uh, um, birth. Uh, Etc. And these are all interesting theories, but we 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 are lacking, you know, definite evidence, kind of like to state uh, s- s- such things. Um, and I think that it's important, like, to to go a bit uh, specific in terms of like the similarities and the differences of the phenomenology. You know, like the dream state. When you hear, you know, when you look into the research, the qualitative research on, 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 you know, how dreams unfold and you look into the research of like the DMT state, there seems to be, you know, the phenomenology is not the same. The experience is not the same. It has different sort of features. Dreams appear to be much more conventional, you know, it's experiences uh, kind of like your day to day sort of experience, but something weird happens along the way. Whereas the DMT state is much more governed by, you know, extraordinary entities, fantastic sort of phenomena, et cetera, you know, so this could be kind of like some of the differences. Mm. There's also, uh, there's also, um, there's also some points of consideration for various, uh, I believe they're called oneirogens. Uh, I've, I've read of various research chemicals, which is, you know, obviously the common term of not illegal drugs that work as acetylcholinase inhibitors that radically enhance dream state. And then also, um, Martin Fortier, a Colin, a uh, colleague of yours talks about the qualitative difference in, uh, the experiences of something that's a tryptamine such as DMT and something that is a acetylcholinase inhibitor such as Datura and that the Datura style ones tend to kind of resemble a lot more of the conventional dream than, uh, than a DMT experience. So possibly there's some correlations there, uh, um, some sort of combination or, 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 or influence from both, but yeah, there's, I, it seems like it's just such a complex mechanism that an association doesn't necessarily denote like a definitive cause. I think it's a, yeah, I mean, that that's definitely kind of like a, a good pointer in terms of like, uh, you know, the Tura and, and the anticholinergics, you know, they, they also denominated, you know, the lyrogens, um, which is, you know, seem to be closer to that death state, uh, or seem to be closer to dreams at times, you know, like the main difference is that this criteria of reality is lost under, you know, the lyrogens, the tour, et cetera, uh, where it is, I would say, at sensible doses preserved under uh, DMT or other psychedelic drugs, or, or the classic psychedelics, you know, like LSD or DMT or psilocybin. The other main difference would be like, you know, the, the tour and the anticholinergics, they you know, generate these frank hallucinations. It's proper, like, with eyes open, people report, you know, actually speaking, you know, to things in reality, and they think they're real. There's no, you know, there's not this sense that, you know, you're still grounded in some other sort of space at the same time. That being said, you know, very, very high doses of DMT might generate sort of effects as well. So it's also kind of like a muddy a muddy field, it's, it's hard really to tell. But in terms of the role of endogenous DMT, is something that I would definitely not rule out. I mean, we still don't know. Maybe an interaction of different molecules in which DMT plays a part for, you know, all these extraordinary experiences. There may be an involvement, but, you know, we definitely need further research. Mm-hmm. You had uh, mentioned sort of coming to see a correlation between uh, DMT experiences and the reports of near-death experience. And from what I understand, the research around um, psilocybin was showing that uh, there was a like a global reduction in brain activity, that uh, the brain sort of like on the whole slowed down a little bit more than normally. And I'm considering about 
the theory that consciousness um, is an epiphenomenon of brain activity and then wondering what your thoughts are on research emerging that shows a reduction in brain activity being correlated with an increased sense of inner subjective richness and the idea that something that increases such incredible richness in the experience such as dmt could be correlated to the dying of the brain i'm curious what your thoughts are um, on that around consciousness and, and and in this question is a is a sort of a probing as to what the psychedelic experience I don't know if you've had personal experiences or if you could talk about that, but at the very least, the ongoing research about it, what it's, how it's uh, affecting your perception of, of what is reality and your own personal philosophy on consciousness. Wow. Uh, okay, so in the, in the first, uh, kind of like, the first bit of your question, in terms of like um, how, you know, reduction to brain activity can uh, be related to, you know, the psychedelic state, which, you know, appears to be very rich. Um, I think it's very much related to the fact of how we understand these brain results. Um, you know, what, what we kind of like, what we have seen with psilocybin um, is that there's a kind of like a reduction in the, 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 this kind of like... Um, reduction in the default mode network, deactivation of the default mode network. Or you would say kind of like in the brain states, in the, in the brain areas that were lighted up in the normal waking state, they kind of like shut down. That, you know, we have seen that in the research. But what we have seen at the same time is that these brain networks that are usually, you know, very differentiated or very kind of like uh, well-structured, um, they become less differentiated. You know? They start working with each other at the same time. So saying that in the brain all that you see is just a reduction of activity would be kind of like an, a very incomplete story. You know? uh, what we also see is that different you know, brain networks are working together, areas of the brain that are not communicating are communicating, um, the brain activity becomes much more unpredictable. You know, you have a signal, you have ways of seeing, of understanding brain activity based on past brain activity of that brain. You can say, oh, I kind of like, I can determine with a certain degree of certainty what's going to happen next in the brain. What we see is that under the psychedelic state, this becomes much more predictable. And you can say that at that level, you know, things start to be much, much more similar to uh, the experiential features of these experiences. Experiences, features, yeah, it's a bit redundant, but, but anyway. Uh, so um, I think there's, there's quite a lot to say in terms of how we interpret brain data and how that, that relates to conscious experience. And it's something that we're still trying to understand. Um, but I think that when we start looking at the brain as this dynamic system, right, and you're starting to see how the brain works uh, in terms of the networks it generates, how it's talking in this global manner versus this localized perspective of this area shutting down here, this area shutting down here, with the dynamic view of the whole brain and how it works in time, we, I think we get a much, much better picture on how that relates to actual brain experience, uh, sorry, to actual conscious experience. So I'd say, kind of like on that apparent paradox, this would be the general sort of way that I would tackle this issue. I think the brain, you know, experience is mediated by brain activity when you look at the brain in a dynamical sense, not in a localized sort of like area sliding up, shutting down sort of way. Is yep, that kind makes of, sense. I don't know, it's clear for me. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So I would say that in, in, in terms of what we know. That being said, we, we still need to figure out, you know, further stuff to understand this, you know, the psychedelic state. I mean, it's it's not uh, still not completely clear. Um, 
And it's kind of like what we're doing. And as we're progressing in the field of neuroscience, you know, we're progressing in terms of bridging, you know, this mind brain relationship, which is very, very tricky. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult to bridge the main difficulty, you know, with, uh, conscious experience is that the data that you can gather in experimental fashion, you know, it's, it's what you would call noisy. You know, it's not as clear cut. People have difficulties remembering stuff. They don't remember with such accurate detail. They may confabulate. They may think something happened when really a different thing happened, for example. The other main difficult with, you know, psychedelic experience is that the experience is very many times ineffable. You know, people are, do not find the words to express this or such things. So the data, you know, the data of the subjective, the subjective experience is a tricky one. It's an easy one to capture. And the data from the brain say the problem that we have is that we don't always necessarily know what it means in terms of experience. So like my approach into this whole thing, and I think this kind of like relates to the second part of your question, um, uh, the kind of like consciousness, view on consciousness, view on the brain, et cetera, and how, you know, the research has changed my views on it as I've progressed on my work and my research here. Um, I have kind of like gradually adopted uh, this way of thinking about about the mind brain, the consciousness problem, if you will, as a way into how can we relate both of these levels, the mind and the brain, in a way that they complement each other, how the data complements each other, how the brain data of experience will help me look into specific aspects of brain activity and how aspects of the brain activity will help me look at specific aspects of the experience to understand this relationship in a, in a better way. So I would say, yeah, that, that's kind of like um, the way in which I think this field, you know, it's important not all, only for psychedelic research, but also for, you know, what you would call consciousness research, you know. It's extraordinary experiences and, and we'll, we're, we will hopefully be able to kind of like marry both of these aspects in a disciplined sort of fashion, which is kind of like what you want in, in the realm of mm -hmm. science, mm -hmm. kind of like a way of getting you know, data that's uh, clean and, 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 and clear and can send a clear message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you talking yeah. about um, a shift into... Uh, of a more of a correlative view, exploring the correlations and mapping the relationship rather than trying to figure out a, a co like what part of the brain is causing experience, which um, I think is a common view, at least for a lot of people that I talk to and sort of the sort of underlying interpretation of a lot of the science papers that I've read is this this um, causal model that that brain activity causes consciousness and that we're looking to find the you know oh, what triggered this experience and i uh, i really appreciate be this this premise of not worrying about whether or not that's necessarily the case and worrying more about well what are the relationships here like what what are the correlations what brain activity is correlated to what um you know particular set of qualia like you mentioned earlier i think uh I, that really resonates with me i think it's very interesting cool yeah i think it's like um it's, it's a way of, of thinking um i think experience is always mediated by the brain that that, that will be my way of, of thinking about it and that's and that's why you know i, I work in the field of neuroscience it's because i think uh, it has, you know, there, there's a mediation by the brain, uh, and that that mediation, the relationship with something before and after, is something that I'm completely agnostic about. Um, but I do feel that, you know, there's a fundamental mechanism there, and we can really understand experience better by looking into the brain, and we can understand experience better by looking into the brain. So, cool. Uh, I have yeah. a so. Let's assume throughout the course of your research, you discover that DMT does have some, I know we're going into some wide-eyed conjecture here, but let's just assume you find out that DMT has some fundamental um, regenerative or healing positive medical uh, effect on the brain. 
say, I mean, you, you mentioned ayahuasca, possibly, you know, studies that are suggesting it might cure cancer. There's definitely lots of studies suggesting that it can um, have a positive impact on uh, conditions of like various mental health issues. And so let's just assume we discover that is the case for DMT and it becomes somewhat um, semi-common medical practice for a person to go and have a DMT type experience um, as a healing practice. And I guess this is like, again, I'm really, I'm really pushing you into a box here with this question. So we can maybe expand it out to think about any given psychedelic as they come in increasingly more so into society and increasingly are destigmatized and the chances of people, the every person being able to have a psychedelic type experience through whatever systems of, of vetting and safety get set up in, uh, in, in our society, where do you see this, the, the qualitative impact of these experiences having on society as a whole? Mm. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I think, um, I think like, in general, uh, psychedelics, you know, um, like, I think like a thing that they do in terms of like, uh, let's say therapeutic properties, you know, and I'm going to stick just to mental health because all of the other stuff is something that I, I, there's, there's very little evidence or, or you know, and, um, uh, I don't want to like speculate on the other stuff, but in terms of mental health, which is what we, you know, mostly know, it appears that like the main thing, um, that their benefit that they may have when they are, you know, positively mediated when they're, you know, the whole set and setting story in the right context with the right people, with the right, you know, uh, guide, friend, therapist, etc. you know, let's say in the future, if they're legal and, you know, there's the possibility of, of positive mediation, because I think mediation is key, by the way, like, um, yeah, it's hard to tell that if they're intrinsically positive for society, I think they may be positive for society when they're rightly mediated. Mm -hmm. Because there's also, anyway, there's also evidence that the, the Vikings, of, uh, of ancient times would I consume psychedelics and then uh, like slaughter people. So yeah, definitely <laughs> mediation is key. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have like very negative stuff, you know, like, you know, even like uh, Charles Manson and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know, when psychedelics are used as a tool. Right. Or the know, weather underground. Yeah. Vulnerability and stuff like that. You know. But these are rare cases, of course. Uh, but it, it speaks, you know, uh, volumes about mediation. Anyway, uh, I think in the, what we're seeing with the right mediation is that they, they're kind of like fostering connection. You know, people are, you know, connecting to themselves, uh, to other people. They connect to the environment, it seems, you know, to nature. Um, so I think, and they enhance meaning. You know, they, they, they seem to provide a lot of meaning uh, into people's lives, uh, with the right mediation, as you said. And that is kind of like what we're seeing as well, you know, in the, in the cases of depression, you know, the depression trial that happened here in Imperial some, some time ago, uh, this collaborator of ours, uh, Ross, Ross Watts, she did, you know, this analysis of, she interviewed people, you know, months after the depression treatment and she found that this was like the key common feature, you know, people were connecting more. They went into from the state of disconnection to connection. So depression being this kind of like illness of uh, lack of meaning, if you will, or lack of connection, and then things acquire new meaning, they, you know, people connect. I think that this, you know, it's hard really to tell if this would have any sort of like big social, political, economical impact, right? Um, but you could say that that could be kind of like, it could be maybe a positive thing on a, on a broader scale uh, if it become more of a widespread thing. I mean, I could say, I mean, if the research, what we're learning from the research so far in terms of like depression um, and that it in fact may work better than your SSRIs or your antidepressants and seeing how many people are depressed in the world, having more people connected with the right treatments 
would make for a very special place. You would you would kind of guess, right? You know, like a more empathetic place, uh, more you know, like human place. Yeah, going further on that is really you know this is this is it's hard. I mean, you could make up stories about you know uh, whatever. But uh, I, I pretty much like the idea that these may be tools, you know, and they may affect positive social change uh, in the right conditions uh, if they are used wisely. Um, but uh, yeah, like I say, it's, it's difficult to advocate for anything as well, you know, like we're researching them right now for mental health and I think uh, I think it's the right way to go about it at this moment. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Chris, thank you so much for your time. And um, actually, is it Christopher? Is that where you're preferred? I just kind of like put you in a... Uh, Chris is fine. I mean, yeah, when I like, yeah. Chris Great, is cool. Fine. Sorry if I had accidentally yeah. uh, made us made us just homies instead of like properly honoring your, uh, your, oh, your no, name. No, state. no, no, it's fine. Uh, yeah, everybody calls me Chris. This is fine. This Christopher is a bit of a mouthful. So, you know, it's a uh, great. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Chris, thank you very much for being on adventures through the mind today for the curious listeners. How can they find, uh, find out more about your research, um, and possibly past research, future research, and also, I'm not sure what's going on with your particular research, though it's becoming increasingly common to have um, outside organizations or crowdfunding supporting research. Is there a, is there a way that people could support your research? Oh, cool. cool. Uh, so um, right now, there's no established mechanism for that. Uh, for support. But I think... For support, yeah, for support because we we kind of managed to secure to secure funding for uh, for this uh, next phase. Um, fortunately, you know, very luckily, you know, and I'm very grateful for the fact, you know, we managed to secure funding for this study. Uh, but there are a number of things that we want to generate, and and I think there's a psychedelic research group page from Imperial College London that people you know can google and then can and they can look at different sort of like projects that we have ongoing and then can contribute to other stuff that we're looking at you know um so that's you know that's that's one way that they can can, can contribute in terms of my research uh you can look me up you know research gate um just type in my name and, and you can find a couple of posters articles here and there yeah. Great. I'll make Let's I'll make see. sure that links to all of those are included in the show notes, which for the listeners are at oh, okay. jncbjesso dot com. Chris, again, thank you so much for being on the show. Have yourself a a very fruitful uh, time of research. Oh, thanks, James. Good luck with the you know your interviews and so on. So, real pleasure speaking with okay. you as well. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you very much for listening. This has been episode 56 of Adventures Through the Mind podcast, and I have been your host, just like every episode, James W. Gesso. Thank you for continuing to support the show by sharing it amongst your social media and telling your friends all about it as you continue to listen to each episode as it releases every other Friday. If you're not subscribed yet, please subscribe now. And if you are subscribed and you're enjoying this podcast and you're enjoying the other content that I am producing, please consider dropping a donation. PayPal or Bitcoin, both are wildly appreciated and even more so is to become a patron on Patreon, which you can find by searching James W. Gesso or heading to jameswgesso.com forward slash support. Or, regardless of where you're watching or listening to it, if you look in the description, you will find a link to how you can support the show. So, thank you very much again, and I will see you on episode 57. Take care.